Today, let's talk about plant diseases. What kind of illnesses can your plants get? How to identify the various diseases, how to classify them, understand the life cycle of the organism, look for the signs and symptoms, and even control for various plant diseases. So here we go with our presentation, disease identification and life cycle. And our title image here is a picture of powdery mildew, one of the very common fungal diseases that can affect your plants. We will cover powdery mildew and many other diseases in this talk. So to start out, an infectious disease is any disease that can attack a plant and after obtaining nutrients from that plant, multiply and spread to infect other plants. When we're focusing on disease control in the landscape, we're primarily talking about infectious diseases because we don't want them to spread to others. We have three general categories of disease-causing agents. They are fungi, bacteria, and viruses. Now, we won't talk too much about viruses today because viruses in plant material, in particular in woody landscape plants, trees and shrubs, viruses are rarely lethal. They don't usually cause significant problems. In fact, sometimes they're desired if they alter the color of a leaf and form like a mosaic or a variegated pattern in the leaf. Sometimes that's something that's preferable or desired. But in addition to not causing detrimental harm, there's also nothing you can do about it. There's no treatment for viruses. Once a plant is infected with a virus, it will have the virus for its life. Many viruses are spread and introduced by organisms like bugs, invertebrates. So you could control for the insect pest to help slow the spread of viruses. But in general, we won't talk about them here because they're usually not a problem and there's nothing you could do about it anyway. We will discuss, however, various types of fungal and bacterial diseases and what types of signs and symptoms you can observe and what types of control methods you can employ. So remember that with infectious diseases, there are signs and there are symptoms. A sign is a characteristic structure of a particular causal agent. For example, if you see a mushroom, that is a sign of the fungus. And here the image is showing sooty mold, which is a fungal condition. And when you observe the dark sooty mold on the leaf, you are actually observing the organism. So that's a sign. On the other hand, a symptom is a visible reaction by the host because it has been infected. So an example of this would be peach leaf curl. When we observe the leaves curling and distorting, we're not actually seeing the disease causing organism, we're seeing the effect it has on the plant. And so being able to recognize key signs and symptoms is your number one step in order to identify the problem so you can act appropriately. And when we talk about these diseases, it's important to consider a concept known as the disease triangle. What that means is there are three components for a disease to happen. And you need all three pieces in order for this to work. Those three pieces are the pathogen itself. It needs to be present the host itself, it needs to be present, and the environment, the conditions need to be appropriate to encourage an infection. All three of these aspects need to be in sync or 
appropriate at the right place at the right time for an infection to take place. Along these lines, you have three primary ways to deal with any disease. You can attack the pathogen or prevent the pathogen through various horticultural techniques. You can strengthen the host or you can eliminate the host and select a different type of plant so that there is nothing to infect. Or you can change your environment, your horticultural practices, your watering, your, your pruning practices in order to either encourage or discourage infection. And it's important to remember with this disease triangle that you will select where on the triangle is the appropriate place to act when it comes to managing plant diseases. So now let's talk about bacteria, the first primary group that we're going to talk about. And as we know, bacteria are ubiquitous on Earth. They are found all over the place. There are many of them. They are quite numerous. And because they're not observable without a microscope, they often aren't considered. However, they're vastly important to all life. Just like in humans, the majority of bacteria on Earth are not pathogens for plants, but there are some. So let's discuss bacteria life cycle and identification. Bacteria are one of three main domains of life on Earth found in almost every possible habitat. They are prokaryotes. And what a prokaryote is, is a unicellular organism that lacks a membrane-bound nucleus or other organelles. Don't worry too much about the terminology in this context, but just pay attention to those two diagrams below. On the left, we have a eukaryote, which is like an animal cell. Notice that it has a lot of organelles or, you know, pieces that are kind of collected and contained inside the cell. Contrast that with the prokaryote on the right hand side, and all the parts are just kind of mixed in in the middle. And so that's bacteria. We can classify bacteria into three primary growth shapes. And these are literally just descriptions of what they look like under a microscope. So the first classification is coccyx. And coccyx means round. So you have round bacteria, ball-shaped bacteria. Then the next one is bacillus. Bacillus is rod-shaped bacteria, or kind of like a, an oval or a rectangle, uh, depending on how you look at it. So you can see an image there of bacillus, the red image. And the third main growth shape is spirillus, or corkscrew shaped. You can see an image down below of that. Now, these three bacterial groups may have additional appendages for moving around, little tails that we call flagella. And really, based on these three growth shapes, the presence or absence of flagella, that's your number one way to identify under a microscope what type of bacteria you have. There are other tests, other ways to verify, but uh, that's basically what we're doing is describing them on a microscopic level. When bacteria reproduce, they multiply very rapidly. They go through a process called binary fission. Binary fission is an exponential growth process. The diagram on the left-hand side shows that in 20 minutes, one bacterium will become two bacteria. And then, so therefore, 20 minutes later, those two will have become four, each one becoming two. And so now 20 minutes later, those four will become eight. And so very quickly over time, you have a rapid population growth when the environment and the host are aligned with the disease-causing organism. So we ask ourselves two questions. 
how are bacterial diseases introduced into plants and how are bacterial diseases disseminated so how does it get into your plant and then once in your plant how does it spread to the others well it gets into your plant through openings and some of those openings can be quite natural they can be the holes in the leaves where respiration takes place. Those are called stomata, or bacteria can enter through the lenticles. Those are small openings on the stem of the plant. Or finally, bacteria can enter through a wound. And that's a wound that is either caused by a break in a branch, a pruning job that was done improperly, or even a pest insect that can break through the plant and become a vector of disease. How are bacterial diseases disseminated? They can be spread in the environment through the wind, through water, through contaminated tools, or from those insects that feed from plant to plant. So we'll discuss a few very common bacterial plant diseases in detail. The rest you can learn about on your own. We're going to discuss fire blight, leaf scorch, crown gall, and leaf spot. Fire blight is quite a pesky disease in the landscape. We can identify it with uh, blight conditions on blossoms, twigs, and fruit. The infected blossoms will wilt. They turn dark brown as the bacteria move down the spur into the leaves. Uh, the twigs will take on a torched look and develop a, a curve, kind of like a shepherd's crook or like a J hook. Um, that's characteristic of fire blight. And the fruit will become watery and may ooze out milky or amber colored sap. Ultimately, it looks like this plant was burned or caught fire. It's dark brown, dead and dried, and kind of drooping or wilting in its appearance. The damage is sporadic dieback of foliage, stunted and deformed growth, and can eventually lead to death. Fire blight primarily attacks plants in the rosaceae family, so it's very distinctive in that way. Um, so it will go after apple, pear, pyracantha, toyon, cotoneaster, loquat, just to name a few of the plants in the rosaceae family that are susceptible to fire blight. So what can you do about it? Well, you can use resistant varieties. We encourage good sanitation. What that means is you can cut out the infected twigs and cankers at least 18 inches beyond the infected areas. You could try to use some insecticide to control the spread. Remember, we're stopping the vector, the organism from introducing the disease to other plants. There may be some dormant sprays you can apply if the plant is dormant. And you could potentially apply a bactericide through the bloom period. Usually we're searching for resistant varieties and good sanitation. Now let's take a look at crown gall. Galls are overgrowths on the trunk that may vary in size from the size of a pea to up to 50 pounds. It almost looks like a tumor. And these are caused by hyperplasia and hypertrophy of cells. And this is not to be confused with other types of galls that are caused by insects. Crown gall is caused by a bacterium. And just to explain the terminology, hyperplasia is a large increase in the number of cells. So the number of cells increases rapidly. Hypertrophy is that the cells themselves become very large, larger than normal. Both may take place in order to create crown gall. Crown gall is a soil inhabitant. 
and it will enter the plant through wounds. And when it does, it multiplies rapidly, creating the gall that we can observe. The damage is that it uh, usually enters at an unsanitary graft union, causing disfiguring growth and eventual death of the plant. Here we see an image with uh, roses experiencing crown gall at the soil surface, probably due to an unsanitary graft union. So what do you do? Well, it's important to start with clean nursery stock. Inspect your plants very carefully, and you may even choose to select resistant varieties. Those plants that are grafted should be well wrapped in order to prevent crown gall from entering. You may take a look at soil insecticides, and you additionally want to prevent further damage by avoiding lawnmower or string trimmer weed whip damage on the trunk of the plant near the soil surface. We want to keep a, a good separation between the soil and what's going on under the bark of the plant. Next, we'll talk about oleander leaf scorch. Leaf scorch expresses itself in dieback of leaf tips. Usually the appearance is scorched yellow to light brown or rusty colored leaves. Individual branches or complete sections of the plant may be infected. As you can see with the image on the right hand side showing oleander and how some of it looks perfectly fine and other sections look like they've been scorched. These symptoms may mimic drought or salt burn. If you drive through the San Diego freeways, oleander was once a very common median in the center of the freeway. And if you observe these older oleander stands, you may observe that all along the line, you've got some oleander leaf scorch now introduced. So what is the life cycle of this disease? It's a bacteria that is introduced into the plant by an insect pest. In particular, it's introduced by the glassy winged sharpshooter. And once the bacteria enters, it can multiply and clog the xylem vessels, which ends up creating the conditions of leaf scorch. This disease is the same species as a disease that affects grapevines as well. Uh, it's technically a different strain, but controlling the oleander leaf scorch is important, not just for the ornamental landscape, but we want to help prevent the spread of the economic damage to viticulture, the grapes vineyards in Southern California that produce wine can be affected by uh, leaf scorch, same species of bacteria, uh, also introduced by the glassy winged sharpshooter. So keep an eye out for it and do your part to prevent the spread. How do you control it? Well, once the bacteria has entered the plant, there is no cure. All you can do is prune out the infected portions, similar to fire blight. You can monitor insect populations and remove infected plants if you have them, so we can help to stop the spread. Next, let's talk about bacterial leaf spot. The symptoms of this are ooze on the stems, and you will see leaf spots that begin as light green areas and become water soaked. Eventually, those spots turn brown with reddish margins. The leaf petioles may even turn black and shrivel. The petiole is like the stem of the leaf, and the plant may become dwarfed. How is this bacteria spread? It spreads through splashing water. Um, in the water, the bacteria will enter the leaves through wounds or through the stomata, and the disease is most active during hot and humid weather. What's the damage? It's usually just unsightly foliage, 
and it's often found on plants like ivy. Other uh, horticultural crops, including food plants, may experience this, and roses as well are notorious for leaf spot. So what do you do? Well, you could apply a dormant spray if the plant goes dormant. More importantly, you can avoid overhead watering, especially during times of heat and humidity. You can try to water early in the day, so that way the water does not rest and sit around on the plant, and you can remove any infected parts if necessary. Now let's move on to the fungi kingdom. And uh, it used to be a time when fungus were considered plants. They were part of the plant kingdom until we learned a little bit more. And I say a little bit because humanity still knows relatively little about fungi. And there's more to learn. If you're interested and want to become a mycologist, somebody who studies fungi, you are certain to enter a world of discovery. Well, fungi is a kingdom of life and not a plant, not an animal, not a bacteria, but it is an organism that tends to live in the soil, just like bacteria. The vast majority of them are not harmful. In fact, many of them are helpful and even essential to plant growth but a small percentage will become pathogens to our plants. And so let's take a look. Fungi are a separate kingdom from plants because they have no chlorophyll, because their cell walls do not contain cellulose, and they have different biochemical pathways than plants. Although otherwise, they have some similarities, like a cell wall and like uh, certain structures similar to roots and complex interactions with plants, but they're a whole separate thing. Taking a closer look at the anatomy of the fungi, there are spores and fruiting bodies. This is how the fungi reproduces. A spore is a single reproductive unit. It's like a seed, but it does not have a preformed embryo. So similar to a seed, one spore can grow into a new organism. A fruiting body is a sexual or asexual structure that produces the spores. And we're most familiar with mushrooms. The mushroom is a fruiting body of the fungal organism that produces the spores that then are spread into the environment for reproduction. Fungi have hyphae, which are threads or filaments of growth. And this is really the predominant part of the organism. The fruiting body that shows up on the surface, uh, that's just really a temporary expression of the organism. The more permanent and the more significant component is what's usually happening underground or inside of plant organisms. And uh, we call a single thread a hypha, a group of them, hyphae. And if you have a mass of hyphae, it's mycelium. These are terms that may be more or less familiar to you as people learn about the fungal kingdom. Within the hyphae, these fungi have finger-like projections that sprout off. These are called hostoria. This term is similarly applied to uh, plant parasites that hook into our host plant. The hostoria is how the fungi connects to our plant. They can connect in two general ways, intercellular or intracellular, meaning they grow between the plant cells or they pierce and grow into the plant cells. If they're one or the other, they're called either endo or ecto mycorrhiza. And many of these are not only uh, good, they're essential for the plant in nature to gain access to a broader range of water and nutrients. 
almost like an extension of the plant's roots underground. So it's not that they're always a problem, but there is a small subset, about 15% of fungal organisms that can feed on living plants and become pathogens. The fungal pathogens we're going to explore today are black sooty mold, powdery mildew, rust, damping off, peach leaf curl, and anthracnose. One of the most common fungal pathogens is black sooty mold. And what you see is black mold on the foliage. This causes reduced vigor of the plant. The leaves may turn yellow and you'll have small fruit develop. This plant is not a true parasite. It's not really hooking into the plant and feeding off of the plant. Instead, black sooty mold lives on honeydew. And remember, honeydew is the droppings of uh, piercing, sucking insects, little bugs that land on your plant and consume the plant juices will drop honeydew. And remember that the ants are even part of the story because they tend to spread around. Aphids, mealybugs, and scale, those types of insect pests that create honeydew. So if you have the ants, you may have the pest, and then you may have the sooty mold on top as sort of a third condition that needs to be treated. What's the damage? Well, there's no direct damage to the plant since it's not truly a pathogen of the plant, but there is indirect damage, meaning it will cover the leaf. And if it covers the leaf too much, then the plant cannot do photosynthesis, which will lead to stunted growth. And a lot of people don't like it because it looks nasty, looks gross. And so uh, that's part of the damage. It's visually unappealing. So how do you control black city mold? Well, you need to control for the sucking insect that is producing the honeydew. Oftentimes, it means that you should be looking for ants because the ants could be the thing that's ultimately causing the problem. You can prune out infected parts and you can use a hard spray of water or potentially soapy water to apply to the leaves of the plants. I have found that in many instances, going out and wiping down the leaf can even be worth your time. Uh, I used to manage a landscape and I would have volunteers and interns and if it was, uh, if you were new to the crew, you always had to take a turn wiping down every leaf of a plant. And it was fun to uh, have the participants guess if I was serious or not. Are you really telling me to go take a wet cloth and wipe down every leaf on this tree? And my answer is yes, please go wipe down every leaf on the tree. And that sounds like who has time for that? Well, you don't need to do it every day, every week, or every month. If you do it one or two times throughout the season, that's enough to bring back the vigor, the photosynthesis of the plant, and for the black sooty mold to no longer be a problem. So it's up to you. How important is that plant? Do you want to control for black sooty mold or not? But usually, at least once in the growing season, some water or even physically wiping off the black sooty mold is a short-term solution, and ultimately you want to control whatever is causing the problem. Now let's look at powdery mildew. Powdery mildew shows itself as white felt or powder on the top surface of leaves, buds, flowers, or fruit. And this is usually found on the most tender growth of the plant. The life cycle of this fungal organism is that it overwinters as mycelial mats in the soil. The spores will be carried by wind and the disease flares up quickly in humid and moderate temperatures. What type of damage is caused by powdery mildew? It can deform the buds of the plant. It will lead to stunted growth. A lot of people consider it to be ugly and it can destroy flowers and fruit. 
How do you control it? You should avoid evening watering and keep the water on the soil and not on the plant. Use resistant varieties when possible. Very important is to provide the plant with plenty of light and air circulation. In fact, powdery mildew will become very common if you're growing food plants or vegetables in a greenhouse setting. Without the proper airflow, powdery mildew has a high likelihood to take over. Uh, you could potentially hose off plants in the middle of the day and hose them off in a way that allows them to dry before nighttime. And if you absolutely need to, you could resort to fungicides, although usually cultural control can go a long way to solve your problems. Now let's take a look at rust. Rust shows itself as orange, brown, or black spore pustules on the underside of the leaf. And on the top side, you'll see yellowing of the leaf tissue. This has an unusual life cycle where it requires at least two hosts. Interestingly, those two hosts may be thousands of miles apart. So good luck trying to eliminate one of the two hosts. This organism prefers low temperature and a lot of moisture to develop. What kind of damage? Well, it's ugly, reduces the value of the plant, leads to stunted growth, and it attacks a wide variety of plants. How do you control it? Well, you use resistant varieties if possible. Keep the water off the foliage, prune out the infected parts if feasible. You can try to eliminate any host organism, or again, you may try a fungicide. Uh, roses in particular are highly susceptible to rust. And in this case, we recommend trying to select disease resistant varieties. Now let's talk about damping off, otherwise known as seedling disease. There's a whole host of organisms that cause damping off. What it is is seed decay. Usually the seedlings will fall over at the line where they emerge from the soil. And the lower stem will be soft and brown. Kind of they, they grow up and then they fall over right at ground level. Uh, these organisms have a varying life cycle. They may overwinter as a number of different things. They tend to favor cool, moist conditions. And in particular, they like poorly drained soil. They will attack the plant where the cells are not lignified or made woody. And that's usually right at soil level and usually only with uh, seedlings. They're not yet woody, so they can't resist damping off. How do you control this disease? Good sanitation. You should sterilize your tools. You should sterilize the pots in the nursery. You can even sterilize the soil that you grow in, and you can sterilize the growing area. All of that will go a long way to reduce the fungal organism that causes damping off possible to treat the seed or to treat the soil with a fungicide. And horticulturally, you can keep excess moisture out of the seed bed or water early in the day to prevent excess moisture from building up. Here we see some images of damping off and notice how the fungal organism can't be seen with your eye, but you can see very clearly where it is found. On the left-hand side, we have a putting green, or otherwise uh, a closely mowed lawn. And you can see the circles there where there's no seedlings growing. This grass was probably recently seeded. And so the young seedlings are coming up, but the fungal organism is present in the soil and causing some of those seedlings to die off in a very characteristic circular pattern. We see the same thing in a nursery condition with tightly packed growing cells. Uh, certain seeds are sprouting, and we can see that damping off has occurred in roughly the same circular pattern in the tray. Now let's talk about stem and root rot. 
Below ground, that's root rot. Above ground, that is stem rot. And the symptoms of this are softened and dead tissue. Below ground, the small little roots will be softened or dead. Above ground, the stem at the soil line will be brown and black and shriveled up. Stem and root rot overwinters as spores. It's favored by cool, moist conditions and poorly drained soil. And it attacks the plant where the cells are not yet lignified, similar to damping off. The control for this is the same as damping off. Next, let's take a look at peach leaf curl. Peach leaf curl, uh, as the name suggests, goes after peaches and it causes the leaves to curl. Um, what that is, is a thickened curled leaf that can turn yellow and red. It will stunt the new growth, the shoots. The life cycle of this fungal organism uh, will have spores over winter on the tree bark. The spores become active in the spring and will reinfect the young leaves year after year. In San Diego, peach leaf curl is quite common. And if you do not treat your peaches, you most likely will have it every year. What is the damage? Well, you reduce the tree health overall, which can lead to low quality fruit. If it's really bad, it can cause early leaf drop, which uh, means less carbohydrate buildup in the roots. And then that causes a slow start the next spring. So it's a problem that can continue to cause problems year after year. How do you control it? Well, first of all, clean up all the leaves that fall on the soil. You don't want to encourage the growth of this fungal organism. Second of all, you can apply a fungicide in the late fall, which is after the leaves have dropped and in the early spring before the leaves have pushed out. Um, there are dormant sprays that can be applied to the trunks of the trees. Usually these have various names, but they have some part copper in them. And a copper spray on the dormant tree does a lot to control peach leaf curl. And the good thing about uh, copper is it's organic. It's not a synthetic chemical. It's appropriate in organic growing, and it can be done with relative ease. Although you do want to make sure it's before the leaves and the flowers have pushed out in the spring and put it on only when the tree is dormant. And finally, let's talk about anthracnose. Anthracnose is caused by a number of fungal organisms. It shows itself as drooping foliage. You'll see necrotic leaf spots, twig blight, and in extreme cases, it shows itself as witch's broom and ooze on the branches. The image on the right-hand side shows witch's broom. And as you can see, it's a tight-knit collection of branches. The branches tend to all kind of form at the same point along the stem. Anthracnose overwinters as mycelia in fallen leaves and twig cankers. The spores are produced and spread as new foliage appears in the spring. Spores will ooze out of the underside of the veins and spread with splashing rain. Uh, plants that are affected are sycamores, Chinese elms, oaks, vegetables, and fruit. Anthracnose can cause twigs to die. The older leaves will have irregular brown areas, possible defoliation, and large branches may die with several years of infection. So what do you do with anthracnose? You can clean up the leaf litter, you can apply a dormant spray, or you can fertilize the trees to stimulate their growth and hope that they can combat anthracnose naturally. So there we go with a general overview of plant diseases, fungal, bacterial, how to identify them with signs and symptoms, what is the life cycle, and finally, what are the control methods for dealing with these infectious diseases of plants?